Man, he caught another one. Excuse me, sir. You mind me asking what fly you're using? They're of the family Coronamidae, in the order Diptera. There's also some ephemerella excrucians mixed in. That's all Greek to me. Actually, it's Latin. There's got to be a better way to pick the right fly. Picking the right fly. It does not require a degree in Latin or a study abroad in Greece. In fact, today, we're gonna simplify it down so much that you don't even need to know the names of any bugs or fly patterns. Yeah, this is for real. At this point, you've probably heard of some bugs. Mayflies, caddis, stoneflies, midges. Does knowing the names of bugs and fly patterns help you as an angler? Yes, 100%, absolutely. And as you progress on your fly fishing journey, being able to recognize these bugs is gonna become second nature. But as a beginner, you're still trying to figure out how to cast and mend and not get stuck in another tree. You've got plenty of other things to worry about. So today, we're gonna talk about our super top secret three-part formula that will help you pick the right fly for any fishing situation. But before we reveal the formula, we've got to use our situational awareness and get a bit of intel, a little bit of information, because believe it or not, right now, all around me is fish food. But in order to find all this fish food and gather the information that we need to pick the right fly, we've got to check three things. Number one, we need to check on the water. I know it's super tempting, but if you see fish rising and eating bugs off the surface, don't just run up there and start casting. Try your best to sneak up to the water's edge and see if there are any bugs riding along the surface. If you see bugs, pick a couple of them up and take note of their features. Are their wings upright or folded over? Do they have a certain number of tails or no tails? Are they big? Are they small? What color are they? And then we'll make a mental note and we'll move on to check number two. We'll check around the water. As we do some more investigating, we might find bugs in the air or on the banks. If you see bugs near the water, chances are they might be adult aquatic insects that recently hatched. Or you might find some terrestrials that live on land and often get blown in the water and chomped by a fish. Again, we're gonna take note of what we've seen and we're gonna move on to check number three. Check in the water. The majority of a trout's diet comes from food sources below the water surface. So if you don't see any bugs flying around or floating on the water surface, don't worry about it. We can still catch fish. We'll pick up a few rocks, flip them over, and see if we can find anything living underneath them. Again, note their attributes. Brown, dark brown, black, big or small. Are they long and slender or are they short and fat? Now that we've taken some time to check on, around, and in the water, our hard work is gonna pay off. We now have a ton of great information that's gonna help us pick the right fly. If we pair that information with our, drum roll please, right fly formula. In the last masterclass video, we talked all about this, but your job as a fly angler is to figure out what fish are eating, the natural food source, and then match it with an artificial fly out of your box. If we can accurately do that, we're gonna put tons of fish in the net. And so with those food sources that we found on, around, and in the water, there are three characteristics that we need to get dialed in. And in fact, these three characteristics make up the three parts of the right fly formula. The most important thing to consider when trying to match up a fly in our box to a real life bug is size. In our experience, Fish care way more about the size of the bug than they do anything else. If you're fishing something that's like three or four or five times bigger than a real life bug, chances are the fish are gonna know that it's fake. Second, we'll consider the shape. 
Does the real life bug have a tapered body? Is it segmented? How many legs does it have? Does it have legs? Is it long and skinny or is it short and fat? Upright wings like a sailboat or folded over like a tent? The differences in shape are the result of different bug types and life cycle stages. This is where knowing if the bug or the fly is a mayfly or a caddis or a midge will make you a better angler. But if you're just starting out, you can hold that bug in one hand and grab a few different flies in the other and by process of elimination, find a decent match. And then remember our first characteristic size is the most important. So once we've got that dialed in and we move on to shape, I would argue that we don't need a 100% perfect match. If it kind of sort of looks like the bug, we're in business. And that leads us into the third part of our right fly formula, color. Unless you're fishing on a very highly pressured river that sees tons of anglers on a daily basis, it's pretty rare to run into a fish that refuses your fly just because it's the wrong color. If you can match up the size and shape and then offer that fly up to a fish with fantastic presentation, that fish is gonna smack your fly 9.8 times out of 10. Now, if you've enjoyed this video thus far and you wanna take a deeper dive into the bugs and the hatches and the fly pattern side of things, we've actually put together a 50 plus page ebook. It's totally free. I'll link it in the video description. All right, so the best way to learn fly fishing is to head out on the water and try something out for yourself. But the second best way is to watch somebody else go out to the river, go through the right fly formula and put it to the test. And so Spencer's out on one of our favorite rivers right now. It's a bit overcast, bugs are hatching, fish are rising. It's an exciting time to be alive. So let's send you on over to him. just got done learning a whole bunch about how to pick the right fly for any fishing situation. Now we're out here on the river and guess what? There's an incredible midge hatch going on right now. In fact, I really didn't even want to stop to film this. Alex had to kind of pull me away from the river and say, no, we got to teach. This is great. This is a good learning moment. And it is because what we've got going on behind me is a midge hatch. Now, I know they're midges, but if you're new to fly fishing, you probably don't. This hatch is super easy to match though, if you use the right fly formula that we just talked about. I got down here to the water, I took a look around me. I could see a bunch of fish rising, so I looked at the water surface and I saw a bunch of tiny little black bugs. So that was my first clue, I needed something small and black. I could also see those bugs buzzing around in the air, so I knew that, that had to be what the fish were eating. So I opened my fly box, dug through it, found a couple tiny little midge patterns and tied them on. Now, I'm using smaller patterns than I normally would because I'm on a tailwater. The river that flows out the bottom of a dam is called the tailwater. And on these rivers, the trout tend to be a lot pickier about patterns and presentation. You've gotta get it just right. So I tried to match the size as perfectly as I could. So the flies I picked for this little midge hatch is a mat midge, and then I've got a little zebra midge dropper below it. The Matt's Midge is a size 18 and I picked it because it's about the right proportions, it's about the right shape. So this is the right size and shape. I'm also lucky because it's the right color. Midges are black usually. So I got lucky there. Put the little zebra midge on the bottom because if midge adults are hatching, then you can bet the nymph versions of them are out and about as well. So I tied on a little size 20 zebra midge underneath it. So now let's go out and catch some fish. So there's quite a few fish. So there's quite a few fish rising right behind me and they're rising kind of close and then out in the middle and all the way to the other bank. I'm gonna start with the fish that are closest to me. That's usually what you wanna do. If you try to cast over fish that are close to you to try to reach fish that are you know further across the river, whatever, you run the risk of spooking the ones that are close to you and then they'll go and spook the other ones. The next thing you know, all the fish are spooked and you're standing there wondering where in the heck all the fish went. So I'm gonna start with the fish that are closest to me. 
I'll work my way out. There's one right behind me. I'm just gonna make a few short casts to him and see if he wants to come play ball. What happened there, Spencer? <laughs> I set the hook too early. I got excited. So, I missed the fish. <laughs> well, I didn't miss him. All right, I had him on for a second. I stung him. I just set the hook too early and that happens. I got really excited and was stoked to finally get a fish on the line. But what that does is prove the point because he came up and he ate a dinky little midge. Just like I picked out of the box to match what was going on with this little hatch. folks even a blind squirrel can find a nut every now and then no I, that's proof right there that the rf formula works i came out here i matched a fly in my box to what i saw out on the water made a few casts cut a really nice brown trout to end the day now i'm kind of sick of talking i'm gonna get back to fishing but there's your reminder that this formula works all right i hope you were able to learn and have some fun out there alongside spencer as he put the right fly formula to the test in the next module of the Beginner Fly Fishing Masterclass, we're talking about something that is absolutely vital to your success as a fly angler. And this might be hard to believe, but it's even more important than picking the right fly. We're talking all about perfecting your presentation. Check it out right here.